Let's of course start from the split album with Satare. I I believe that uh, you came uh, up with the title for that album. So could could you tell me a bit of a background uh, for that title and your part of the recording? Yeah. Um. So Argyropia came up because of the alchemical, you know, Chrysopia, and it's ancient Greek. Uh, it's symbolic of the philosopher's stone and i uh, i obviously have a particular interest in that in regard to what katrina and i were going through um as individuals um our work our great work you know as artists and as friends and uh so the reason why it goes from chrysopia into argyropia is because um you know argyros is silver uh, as opposed to chrysos, which is gold. And um, the, you know, it's funny because, I mean, the actual work itself often involves either silver or any precious metal for that matter. But gold is like this, uh, it, it definitely takes the limelight, you know, it's the front of the stage. And I understand that. Um, <clears throat> but in all reality, silver was actually sometimes the goal of that alchemical working for the Philosopher's Stone. And uh, I think that it uh, should be brought to light, so to speak, for many reasons. Um, you know, I think that silver is, in some respects, uh, as far as a precious metal goes, it's, it's as valuable, if not more valuable, in its abilities than gold is. Um, it has probably more industrial value. It's uh, more electronically conductive. It's more thermally conductive. It is, what else can I think of? Uh, it's more reflective. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why silver is a very valuable precious metal. And I think that it just is overlooked in regard to its preciousness and gold is more a um it's more of the charisma of gold rather than what gold really is you know and i think so this is why i brought this up is because i feel like let's bring up something that people haven't been focusing on this is you know something that for instance you know uh one of the alchemists who was a female which there are female alchemists and uh, her name was actually cleopatra she was greek I think like third century or something. And she uh, she works with several different, you know, philosopher stone, you know, type uh, things. And she was actually, she wrote about, you know, Chrysopoeia, but even in what she was doing with Chrysopoeia, she actually states, or she has diagrams of her working specifically to obtain silver. So that's what it all comes from. And I mean, it's it's even more involved than that. That's just the, that's just the tip of the iceberg, I guess. <laughs> okay, and what could you tell about uh, your part uh, of the album, of the music? Is, was there like a, a theme, theme to all those songs or uh, what was like the idea behind this uh, record? Well, you know, uh, Katrina approached me because uh, we have a long history and uh, she had been working on her music for a while. And I was working on my other music as Zania Morgan. Um, but my history is not the more dancier, if you can call it that, electronic music that I'm doing now. My history was uh, far more ambient and uh, maybe trance inducing, not trance as in rave, but literally as in a physical trance, inducing ritualistic, um, and so, you know, we were having a conversation she's like that, that work really greatly inspired me. And, um, and she was about to do her release and she was like, uh, is there any way you would jump in on this with me? <laughs> you know, and we're in quarantine and, uh, I've been very busy because I'm an herbalist. So my work has never subsided during this whole thing. But I was so excited. I would love to. So uh, I think in a very short amount of time, I ended up, you know, living in the studio that I'm in right now. 
um, and just really getting into the momentum of what her and I had been going through together and what we saw this time as a conduit for or a bridge for. And um, to me, that was definitely metamorphosis, as this time has been for many people. And so uh, we honed in on that and I honed in on that and I really entered a more ritualistic state with it. And these songs are not normal. This isn't the kind of song you listen to when you want to hear, you know, ambient music normally. It's not the music you listen to when you want to hear, you know, anything normal, I guess. <laughs> really, honestly, this is this is a trip. I'm taking you on an adventure. The idea is I want you to pull, I want you to actually open up to the world that I want to convey. So it's it's definitely more of a let's go take a hike in the woods at night and come with me. This is me sharing a bit of myself with people. This isn't a normal song to just listen to in your car. You know, both of the songs are that way. Yeah, you said that you were kind of uh, locked in the studio while writing this uh, music. Was uh, this time writing this uh, these two songs, was it very different on how you usually uh, write your music? Yeah, this time it was. Um, diff different only in the sense that uh, I was trying to work away from my beat-centric um, style again. Uh, even in the beginning, I think, uh, you know, there's always been a heavy beat, not a fast beat, but I really love drums. And as a pianist, um, percussion is natural for me. And so uh, early days of Xenia Morgan, uh, I was actually not called Xenia Morgan. It was Israfel and Necropolis was my very first manifestation. And back in those days, um, it was born out of me coming home from school and uh, entertaining myself by writing music to old movies. And so I used to sit in there with my microphone and watch some old beautiful film that I love, turn down the volume, of course, and like, you know, wrinkle paper and open up books and make little sounds and stuff. And it was, you know, that's how it all came out. And, and from there, you know, I ended up developing more music. And one day, you know, my roommates are listening to me and they're like, you should really do something with this. And the next thing I know, you know, uh, Tyler, who was a friend of mine at the time from uh, Ajna Offensive, which is a label um, currently active. And so he was putting out this four CD compilation called Infernal Proteus. And uh, he invited me to be on that. So that was my very first, you know, introduction to the world was as Israfel Necropolis. And I did a song called um, The Great Sycamore Tree. I, I mean, all of the songs had to be about plants. That was a whole deal. And so I chose the sycamore, not the sycamore that people are familiar with as in like European or, but as the Egyptian sycamore. Okay, how do you see the kind of evolution of your inspiration? I mean, talking about you started from uh, doing like uh, then to music to old movies and now like going deep in inside and, you know, coming out with something something new about this time. So how do you see the evolution of your inspiration? Yeah. Um, hmm. You know, no matter what, this whole time, uh, music is a journal. And I'm not the kind of musician who does music because I want to get it out to the world. I'm doing it because I have to. <laughs> you know, some people go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, you know, and um, that's not my style. So I basically just, you know, closet myself into a creative box and, and release. And that's what music is for me. Um, it was really more about that, and it, it, you know, my method of being in my body, you know, being able to wake up the next day and be okay with the fact that my spirit is encased in this flesh and, and face that day, you know, with new vigor. And really, honestly, the music is what enables me to do that. So they, it starts from that, from a very simplistic level of being just my journal entry to 
being real rituals that I'm doing. And sometimes, you know, those rituals were meant specifically to be done live. So that, you know, develops into me performing live and, um, you know, it, the recordings weren't that important. They were just merely a bone structure for me to work off of, for me to show the people who are drumming with me more, more than anything. And for me to remember what I was doing too. And so it was a guide. And so everything that I have, like, you know, you know, I have some songs that are on SoundCloud. Those are all demos that I did for live performances, you know, and then, you know, sooner or later, you know, I was hanging out with these guys, Catabatic, which is, uh, you know, I, I guess a dark electronic collective, so to speak, um, here in the Bay Area. And um, I've been, you know, hanging out with them for a long time, you know, from Anima Nocturna, which I mentioned being really influential as to how Katrina and I met and our, you know, sinewy, you know, links. It's um, very much Anima Nocturna, that group, that collective. And then I met Catabatic and I moved to California from Washington and really immersed myself in Catabatic. And they would do all of these, you know, a lot of them are cultists. They're more magically inclined or at least open to that perspective. And so you get a lot of very creative, very spiritually minded and or occult minded people gathering and doing solstice events. And so really that's what I was doing most of the time. And it, my music grew from being this like sort of ambient structure um, or pieces that I couldn't even really perform live. So really, honestly, my first performances were just ritual, you know, ritual happening to the music in the background. That's how it first started. And then I was like, hey, I'm going to start playing this and, you know, doing it, bringing more people in. And then the next thing I know, I, you know, I'm like developing more beats. I'm getting dancier. And over the years, it just became progress more in that that way. And then I got hit up because of these songs I was submitting to Catabatic for some of their compilations by that label um, and uh, in France. And so the, you know, we put out my first album and uh, it was quite an adventure. It was difficult. And I feel that the mixing wasn't the best it could have been. <laughs> But, you know, it's it is what it is. I'm I'm happy that I got it out. It was my first real attempt at doing everything myself, except for the mastering. So I do the art on it. I do the mixing. I do everything. And uh, I realized after that that uh, it's OK to bring people in a little bit here or there. <laughs> I don't have to do everything myself. So basically, the development I'm trying to get at um, is, you know, from the more ambient stuff to the more dance stuff it's really just an aspect because if i had more time i would do everything and to be quite honest um i haven't ever given up the ambient it was really weird for me to figure out how to go back into doing xania morgan and still have an ambient element because i work with a black metal project right now and a hecatol and uh it's, you know, I do all the ambient for it and the keys. And so, you know, it's very strictly ambient. So I'm like, okay, this is ambient, you know, but I don't sing to that. <laughs> so anyways, you know, the merging of these worlds. Okay, you, you have been talking about the, the live rituals. Uh, what are kind of the building blocks of, of your live rituals and what kind of experiences are they? Well, the live rituals change extensively. Um, you know, it depends on my environment. So when I am out, so when I'm outdoors, you know, outside, uh, I can get more elaborate and I will bring more people in. And um, if it's indoors, which I, you know, have done on occasion and more recently before the pandemic I was doing, um, that is, you know, less bombastic, more intimate. It's very hard um, to introduce what I do to a public that is coming to see a dark electronic show or a dance show or something like that. It takes a lot of nerve 
to get up there when I'm not in a sacred environment already and to try and turn the bar <clears throat> into a space that is exemplary of what I'm proposing and or explaining or sharing with the audience is a lot of work. So I can't, you know, these days um, I don't always go the whole nine yards, but given the opportunity, I will. <clears throat> but no matter what, the core essence of what the audience is receiving is all ritual. Um, and so oftentimes people will come to me after shows and they'll be like, oh, you completely put me in a trance. I just left my body. You know, things happened to me that never happened to me at a show. And that to me makes me feel like the work is done. Okay. Um, you also mentioned that, uh, well, uh, if you would have time, you would do everything by yourself. So your artistry is, of course, much more than we can hear on the album. So. Uh, would you care to talk a bit more about the uh, other aspects of your art history? Yeah, um, I've been compelled by art, actually art and math from an early age. Um, you know, when I was in high school, I was in Arts Honor Society and and I was teaching math classes when my teacher was gone and geometry specifically, not algebra or anything. <laughs> But I that the geometric, the element of math is something that I'm very, very compelled by. And that truly is a very visual sort of space oriented, you know, uh, experience from a math perspective. It's definitely more of a creative zone for math. And so from that, I like, you know, was drawing a lot and doing a lot of equations and really got into feng shui and just the space, space and uh, you know, conjunctions and aspects of the, the, you know, the things in my environment were very obvious to me and very influential to me. So, so yeah, my art um, was pretty big for a long time before I was able to really get into my music. And, you know, I was a traveler when I was young. I traveled, you know, on trains, hopping trains, you know, just being adventurous for years. And when you're doing that, you, you know, you can't carry equipment with you. I think I just had a little drum that I carried with me sometimes. But you know, so art was the, the way of expression for a long time for me. And then that, you know, once again, to me was just merely a journal entry. My art was never meant to be, you know, um, housed in a gallery, simply was just something I did. And um, and then, you know, eventually, you know, poetry was a big thing for me, too. I'm definitely a writer, you know, and heralding back to, you know, some of my, you know, influences as I became more deeply involved with the occult. I mean, I was always involved since a child, but when I was actually reading other writers and taking in their their essence to understand from them what was a motivational force for them as an occultist, um, I was really into Austin Osmond Spare. And his, you know, chaos medium or his um, automatic writings and automatic drawings and uh, it was pretty much the way I approached things. And, and I still do actually. And my lyrics and my poetry specifically, um, a lot of that comes from something way deep in my psyche. I, I definitely usually get into a sacred space before I write lyrics. And, and to be quite honest, not only that, but a lot of my lyrics come from nonsensical verbiage, so to speak. So I will just start saying things and that's part of the automatic process. And then I will record myself and then I'll go through it and I start perceiving what I'm saying to myself. And I end up pulling that out, you know, and, and, and then I understand the story more and then I'm able to, um, you know, uh, elaborate on that more extensively. And, and so that's still to this day what I do oftentimes. OK, yeah, uh, you mentioned that uh, occultism has been in your life for a long time. So uh, what are kind of the roots of your occultism and uh, how, how is the occultism uh, present in your li everyday life? So when I was really young, uh, I was very lucky, actually. Um, at the time, I didn't know that, but I grew up in a haunted house. 
And um, it was very intense. So from the age of seven until 13, I was vastly introduced to the occult world um, without me even understanding what it was, you know. So seeing spirits and, you know, I mean, literally things were moving in our household. Entities were breathing on people's necks. It was hard to keep a roommate. It was, you know, without a doubt, um, I was immediately forced into a paradigm where I had to acknowledge that there were unseen phenomena all around us, you know, and I was in the thick of it. And so um, it was a huge challenge to come to terms with that. Um, I was definitely a natural empath. I spoke with these spirits and thought it was normal. And then when my mother, you know, really understood how deeply involved I was in this and I had spirit friends and things like that, she got a little concerned about me. <laughs> and, you know, I, I became less interested in the physical world after a while. And so, uh, you know, I had a near death experience at a young age. And I think that after that, too, I. You know, I've always there's a part of me that is here. And there's a part of me that is not just here. I mean, I've always had this sort of consciousness since then that um, is far greater than what I'm experiencing in a more secular, immediate, you know, paradigm. And uh, so that in and it of itself is a huge element of my occultism right there. And um, I didn't need a book or anybody to tell me anything, you know. Um, I got my first tarot deck, you know, I got, uh, you know, my mother was helping me. She was worried and she's like, you need tools. You need to figure out what's going on with you. And so she started taking me to meditation courses and, um, and I got to develop my skills more. And I have to say meditation has helped me more than probably just about anything. There's nothing as enlightening as being in the thick of a true meditative state and then pulling that energy back into my waking consciousness and enacting it, you know, in the physical paradigm. Um, anyhow, that leads, you know, as I get older, you know, I'm like really into punk rock and, you know, I don't want to look like a lame ass to the punk rockers because, you know, if you're into magic, then you're a hippie, <laughs> you know, so I kind of hid you know, my devotion. Um, and, and then finally one day I was like, I'm just not hiding this. I can't hide this anymore. And besides my partner at the time found my hidden altar, found my ritual pieces and was horrified. <laughs> and, you know, and I'm just like, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't play this game anymore. This is not me. So I, I just really, you know, decided to totally embrace who I was. And that's when I started reaching out to other occultists and finding out what was going on in the world. You know, it's like, who else is out there? Who does this? Who knows this? And I got, that's when I got greatly inspired by um, Austin Oz and Spare, you know? And truly that's the core. It started with that, you know, I got into, you know, ancient Egyptian practices and voodoo and Santeria, Macumba, and all this really gorgeous, rich, culturally rich, you know, magic. Um, which is not my ancestry, but I had so much to learn from it um, that it was entirely compelling and truly moved me into a new hemisphere of being. I mean, I took a uh, Yoruban dance or a Congolese dance and, um, you know, I'd only done ballet, you know, as a child, like growing up, of course. And um, it was like mind blowing the difference in the cultural motivation behind the music in that dance even. And so to embrace those beat structures and that was influential in all respects in my occultism as well. You know, I've started being visited by sages in my dream, you know, old black ladies, you know, who lived in Africa, taking me to places. It was amazing, you know, and so that was the beginning of that adventure. And so I just keep following my dreams. You know, I keep following these crossroads of people that I'm meeting and learning as much as I can.
And so, you know, it goes from there. And next thing you know, I'm involved with uh, the IOT, which is a chaos order, you know, the uh, Illuminati's of Thanateros. And I did that for a while. And then I became part of the uh, OTO, Order Templi Orientis. Um, and just went on that road and learned a lot about Western esoteric magic, uh, hermeticism and all the influences of Western esoteric magic in general. Um, and, you know, really embraced it thoroughly. Uh, I, I've read and read and read. I've, I've taught people the things that I've read. I've shared as much as possible. I, I've been in covens. I've done all sorts of things. And in the end, um, after everything, to be quite honest, like, I think I am, as far as what I read or take in, I think I probably read more science than I do occult, you know, as far as like the information I'm pulling in from other sources these days. And the reason I do that is because science to me is the occult. I mean, they're, they work hand in hand. They, well, they're the same thing actually in my mind. And so I think I am at this point, I have so much information that I've gleaned from other authors as far as occultism goes that I can kind of find what I need to on my own. And um, science is very exciting. It gives me a new medium of expression for that magic. Okay, uh, you said that um, in the beginning you have to kind of hide the occult side of you. So um, how difficult is it to like mix the occult way with the uh, current system or so way of living? Has there been a lot of uh, problems for you trying to intertwine these two worlds? Um, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm the reason I'm laughing is because I have isolated myself from, you know, normal society in a way that is not truly just physical. I'm not, I'm not saying physically isolating myself from normal society, but I have created a niche for myself. You know, I, you know, I'm, I've got facial tattoos and hand tattoos and I, I'm, you look at me and you don't see a normal person. Um, I am constantly surrounded by people who are uh, parallel to my interests um, because I either invite them or I seek them or they just happen. And so therefore my work and my music and my hobbies and you know my fun life and friends and everything kind of like sort of is mirroring this back at me. So these days, um, it's, you know, I think more than anything, I, as an herbalist, I experience, you know, people coming at me and sometimes being afraid of me or, um, or, or thinking that I'm a Satanist or something, you know, because of the way I look. And, uh, and, and, you know, religion is huge these days. Still, I, it's kind of mind blowing to me how far reaching religion and how extensively influential religion still is today. And so that's huge. So people look at me and I'm very, I'm a free person. I'm a free agent. You know, I am autonomous. I don't abide by, you know, any order and I don't abide by any philosophy or, you know, theology. I, I, it's entirely my own. So anyways, people come to me and I think that there is that, that, that bridge that I have to cross with them. Of, you don't have to be afraid of me, you know, thing. Um, and so that's when I'm interacting with society where they don't understand. I'm so thankful because living in the United States and living in California and, um, you know, offers me a lot of freedom. Um, as an occultist, as a woman, as, you know, um, someone who is, you know, not subject to the normal stream of things, you know, so, so I'm obviously, you know, um, I don't, I don't know what the word is I want to say for this, but I'm, I'm part of a subculture, so to speak. And that subculture is thankfully very present where I am. 
So I feel a little bit like I have my safety net. There are places still today in the world, as we know, where that freedom is not given. So, you know, I couldn't, you know, espouse occultism. I couldn't, you know, even say the things or do some of the things I do as a woman. So, um, I mean, not to say, you know, I, I, I felt bad for a moment when I was, you know, stating this of like, oh, I, you know, separated from that normal society. I'm really not. I'm very invested in what's going on in the world. I just have created a niche for myself. Uh, do you think that uh, occultism will forever be in that niche, basically in in society, or or should it even be more widely known? I mean, uh, it seems that world would benefit a bit of spiritualism uh, if e everybody could deal with their emotions. It would do a lot of good at the moment. Yes, <laughs> that's yeah, right. <laughs> very true. Very true. Um, I, you know, I think that the more we advance um, scientifically, the more people's minds are going to open. Uh, we are going to find out the things that we were afraid of are actually far, far less um, endangering to our person and, and more of a evolutionary process of our person. I think people are going to realize that it's natural and that they just need to learn how to use it. My only fear with all things, and I wouldn't even say it's a fear, it's just my, I recognize that, you know, um, all tools will be used according to the, the interest um, of the individual. Therefore, your intention is what matters. So, you know, with all tools, um, they can be used for benefit or, you can use it as a poison or as a medicine, you know, um, and it's up to the individual. Um, we can't take away those things and hope that they will make better decisions. A person is a person, they will do what they do. Um, so occultism in my mind is another tool and um, people will learn how to use it. And as we develop as a society, I truly believe that um, spirituality as a, autonomous manifestation will exist more readily and um you know occultism will be natural definitely